want to first say I appreciate Dr. Charles Connery kicking off this sermon series last week, First Impressions. Uh, it's funny because Chuck's passage that he preached on wasn't really a story that, that connects uh, as well to the overall topic. And when his son, the not doctor, uh, Matt Connery, uh, preached the last sermon he preached in this church, he he, he, he said the same thing. He gave me a hard time, even though I wasn't here. Behind my back, he gave me a hard time because it didn't connect to the sermon series uh, as a whole. But I think that, that Chuck's passage that he preached on, John the Baptist, if you weren't here, I think it was a great setup for what we're going to see throughout this series. I think he did a good job of setting it up, even if he, if he, even if he didn't know it. And uh, Chuck said a couple of things that I think are important. I think these are his two big quotes. First, if you follow God's will, you will find yourself in the center of God's delight. Or in other words, also a quote, you will be happiest when you are living in God's will. And the reality is, watch this connection. Chuck, watch this connection. The reality is that for every person who is going to live with, with God's delight who's going to be happy as they live in God's will, it starts with a first interaction with Jesus. And that's really what we're gonna look at in the rest of this sermon series, are all of these stories where people first meet Jesus. It's like their first impression of Jesus. And the goal of it all is that maybe we would see Jesus in a new and fresh way as we see him through the lens of people who are meeting him for the first time. The reality is that if you're a Christian, then over the years, you know this, you maybe have forgotten what it felt like to encounter Jesus for the first time. That first moment where it hit you just how great he was, maybe how awful you had been, how much in, of a need you had for him, and, and how, how maybe his grace, his goodness, his love, it just swept over you, right? And I think in, in these stories, maybe for those of us who are Christians, we'll see a little bit of our own story, and my hope is that it will kind of take us back to those early moments in our relationship, our connection to Jesus. If you're not a Christian, then, then maybe you're not a Christian, maybe you're not a Jesus follower, because so much of perhaps, for you, maybe, maybe so much of who Jesus is has been tainted by by kind of the people who follow him. And, and you don't know what it would be like even to like just see Jesus in a pure, unadulterated way. And these people who, who you know, had a physical encounter with Jesus, they got to meet Jesus, you know, before like the world had piled on Jesus, right? And they got this just brand new, clean look at Jesus and, and their responses to those first impressions are really telling and I think it helps us to discover who Jesus is apart from maybe what everybody says about Jesus, what, what, what he's been, you know, how he hasn't been tainted, but how our lens in which we see Jesus can be tainted by, by the things that the church sometimes does, by maybe our neighbors who are not so Christ-like, who, who follow Jesus. And so I'm hoping that, that we will all in some way get uh, kind of a fresh look at Jesus. And in this first one, I think it's so beautiful because, because these people meet Jesus and immediately their response is, is to just follow him and then to share him with others, to follow him and share him with others. And man, I think if we could just meet like Jesus, like walking in the flesh, I think it would be so similar to this. And and so it starts with this story of, of Jesus' disciples, the people who follow him around, who hang out with him the, him the most while he walks on earth. It starts with them and their first impressions of him. And we'll see a bunch of stories after this, but it starts with, with these guys who became his closest followers, his best friends, and their first interactions with him. Now in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the other gospels, we'll look in John, but in the other gospels, there's the calling of the disciples. But this seems to be a separate moment in their lives, a separate moment in history. This isn't when Jesus says, hey, you're gonna be, you're gonna be the 12 who, who I commissioned to go out and preach, who you know, found the church minus one, who, who ends up rejecting him and turning his back on him. But, but it's not that moment. This is like the first moment they like, 
see him. Like the first moment they get a glimpse of him, the first moment they talk to him, not the moment they become the disciples, but the moment when they, they are first encountering Jesus. This is their first impression of Jesus. And, and, and I think it's so telling what, what happens in this, but it, it begins with John the Baptist connecting to last week's sermon in verse 35 and 36 of John 1. It says, the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God is a really important title for Jesus. And we've been looking at the Word. That's the whole series we did, which was John's first title for Jesus. But as far as titles go in the actual narrative of Jesus' life, this is the first title, the Lamb of God. John's already said it once. He says it for the second time here, the Lamb of God. It's a really important idea. And I just want to read you a few quotes to to just kind of get to the heart of what it is. To be called the Lamb of God means that God gave Jesus to be killed like a lamb for our sins so we could live forever. That's pretty straightforward, right? To be the Lamb of God means that Jesus has been given to die for our sins. As a nation, Israel's history starts with lambs being killed at the Passover, and then the blood was was painted over their doorways so that the angel of the Lord would pass by their houses, not kill their firstborn sons. The Lamb of God brings people's minds back to this, that Jesus is the one who will die for sin, but also that Jesus is the one who will save. And then, I love this, I read this, uh, the entire Old Testament can be summed up with one question, where is the Lamb? And this quote is a reference to this story of this man named Abraham who is, is told to, to kill his son, and he goes out, and, and his kid, who is about to be sacrificed, or, uh, or so he ends up thinking, his kid is like, where is the lamb? Like, where is the one that's going to be sacrificed? And, and Abraham's, you know, he's going out there and ready to do whatever God wants him to do, but he's so smart in that moment. He says, God is going to provide that lamb. It's like he realizes that while he's willing to do whatever God wants, he's not going to have to kill his son. And sure enough, God provides this lamb. But the question is indicative of the whole Old Testament. Where is the one who is going to die for our sins? And so John the Baptist sees Jesus walking by. He's the guy who's preparing the way for Jesus. And he says, there it is. There's the lamb, the one who's going to die for people's sins. Isaiah 53, 7, speaking of Jesus, long before Jesus ever lived, said he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. It's in the context of of a passage that refers to the suffering servant, that that God would send someone who would suffer for the sins of humanity. And John looks at Jesus. I mean, what a moment, right? And he has two disciples with him, and he says, there he is. There he is. This is their, their initial, you know, the initial thing that gets them interested in Jesus, but then they have their first meeting with Jesus in verses 37 through 39. When the two two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. These two disciples followed Jesus. Jesus. They just followed him. Now, I think that as a first impression kind of statement, that's a really big deal, right? Because because these people, all they've heard is this is the one who who is going to die for sins. And they they probably they probably don't have I mean, I, I would be willing to bet. They don't have all of, all of the theology, all of the nuances that, that we can have as Christians who read the New Testament. They, they don't have, you know, like theological training or education as far as what Jesus will do, what the atonement is like. And yet, when they, when they just get this quick introduction, here's the one who, who is gonna die for sin, their, their reaction is just to follow him, like in a physical sense. But what's interesting about this entire passage we're going to look at today is is that there are double meanings throughout all of it. It's really interesting. John uses these words that that take on profound theological 
uh, importance as he moves through his letter. But here he uses them in two ways almost. And so these people are like, well, if the guy I'm hanging out with was a spiritual leader, everybody's listening to him preach, he's baptized me. If he says that there's a hope that this is the one that's gonna save me from my sins, like I'll follow him, right? And so physically they just, they literally just go after him. But follow is an important word because as you move through this letter, this book called John, and as you move through the New Testament, it's clear that this is also a word that references one of the ideas of being a Christian. To be a Christian is to follow Jesus. That's lost, I think, a lot of times in in American Christianity today because so often we just... We act like being a Christian is just believing something. But John here just, he he gives us a glimpse into something else, right? It is to believe something that Jesus is the one who dies for sin, but it's also to then follow him, to go after him, to live your life for him, to do what he wants you to do, to be sold out for him, to commit yourself entirely to him. That That's what it means to be a Christian. At the very beginning of this, these people, they see Jesus and, and may, we don't know. I mean, this is this the moment of conversion for them or not? Who knows? But like they see Jesus, they want to go to him it's just a natural reaction like if that guy can forgive my sins then I'm gonna go learn from him but also it's it just shows us that to be a Christian to be somebody who partakes of the salvation that he offers is to follow him to try to look like him to try to live like him to be obedient to him to to pronounce him in our heart that he is king of kings and lord of lords John hits on that right at the beginning of this book and Jesus turns around and he says, what do you want? Which I think just comes across in English as rude. I just don't think it was. I think it's a sincere question. Like Jesus wants to know what they want from him. But it is an important question, right? They say, where are you staying? And, and it's really easy, I think, for us to kind of explore Jesus for the wrong reasons. Some people can explore Jesus for the wrong reasons. And Jesus gets, I think, to the heart of that, right? Like, what do, you, what do you want from me? Because for people at the time that are looking for this Lamb of God, a lot of them wanted the wrong things. They wanted, and I think Chuck alluded to this last week, they wanted like a military takeover of the, of the Roman government. That's what they wanted, some people. But the way these guys answer this is really It's really important. They they want to know where he is staying. But before we look at that more fully, I want to just say that they call him rabbi. And and that's a word that was just a respectful word for a public teacher of spiritual things. And and I just I just bring that up right now because, because I think it's really important for you to know that Jesus is an incredible teacher. If that's all you think Jesus is, then you don't think enough of Jesus. We covered that in the last sermon series. But like, if you've never read the teachings of Jesus, then make it a point to read the teachings of Jesus because Jesus is an incredible teacher and they recognize that from the very first moment they meet him. They recognize that this guy is gonna teach with authority. He's gonna teach in a profound way. He has spiritual truth to offer. But these people, they say, you know, what do you want? Like, they say, where are you staying? And this is, Another word that I think has a double meaning here. Uh, The word staying, obviously, they're they're asking like, where are you sleeping tonight, right? Like, what hotel room are you going to be in? But this word is, is, man, just about as important of a word, not at the top, but like maybe top five words in the book of John. And it's this Greek word minnow that translates staying. And minnow is also translated later in the book of John as abide or remain. It's hugely important. We'll come back to it later, but let me read you John 15, 4 right now. Uh, Jesus says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. This word's used twice here, and man, I think that it's so important, right? Because 
the question is like, what do you want from me? And the answer is, we just want to be with you. We want to be with you. And that's really important by itself, right? Like, if we're just trying to get and get and get from Jesus, if we're just taking from Jesus in our relationship with Jesus, and all our prayers always sound like, you know, just wishes that we would wish from a genie or whatever, then maybe something's off in how we're viewing Jesus and how we're seeing Jesus. And at the same time, this word reminds us that that part of being a disciple of Jesus, part of following Jesus is simply just being with him and aiming to be with him and remaining with him and abiding in him. Like, like if you want to be a growing disciple of Jesus, then you must just strive to be with Jesus more frequently. I told you I was on a three or four, I can't remember the exact amount of days. Uh, I had a lot going on after that prayer retreat uh, last week. And and I, I just, you know, I spent a lot of time in prayer, reading the Bible, reading some Christian fiction, uh, reading some Christian nonfiction, like just sitting with with God. And, and man, as I went into the college retreat that I preached at, like every song we sang almost, and I, I don't know these young people's music these days, you know, like I like I, I don't know these songs, but like every song we sang was bringing me to tears. And at one point I just said, I missed you to God. Like, and I, I am pretty consistent with Bible reading and prayer. And uh, I think that my interactions with God are okay, you know, and I'm at church every Sunday and I interact with him here. But to have that just long time away was so fruitful in my life. And when these people first meet Jesus, it's, you know, their first impression results not in them, not in them saying like, hey, what can you do for me? But instead saying, how can I be with you? How can I be with you? And for those of us, man, I think for those of us who have been Christians for a while, We remember that, right? Can you remember back when Jesus first got a hold of your heart and all you wanted to do was to be with him? Church was not a chore. Prayer was not a chore. Reading the Bible was not a chore. It was something that you longed to do because you wanted to be with the Lamb of God, the one who had saved you. And we see glimpse of that right in this this beginning kind of story of Jesus' life as these people have a first, their first impression of Jesus. We need to make an effort to be with Jesus. And then there's this other double meaning. It's like just ripe with double meanings, right? It says, you will see. Follow me and you will see. You will see. And obviously Jesus means like, you'll figure out where I'm staying the night, right? Like that's a part of this. But that language seems to suggest something far more. It seems to suggest that they will They'll see in a spiritual sense, and, and, and I think even more specifically, that they're going to see some really incredible things. I mean, think about, just think about the lives of these men. Had they not gone with him, think about all that they would have missed out on, all the miracles that Jesus did, all of the, the teaching of Jesus, all of the cool stuff that, you know, that wasn't even miraculous, but just that Jesus did and that they got to encounter and be a part of. I mean, the most widely read book in human history is the Bible, right? And they got to see a huge, the most important part of it actually happen right in front of their eyes. I think about Andrew, who's one of these guys here, and uh, we don't know a lot about Andrew, but, but we do know that when uh, there was this moment where there's a bunch of people and they've been listening to Jesus teach and they were getting really hungry and the disciples were like, hey, you gotta send these people home, Jesus, because they're gonna starve to death on the way home if you don't. And, and Jesus like, you feed them. And then Andrew's the guy who's like, hey, we have a few fish and some bread here. And then Jesus feeds 5,000 men plus women and children all with just this, you know, couple of fish, handful of bread, maybe opposite of that. Uh, and like, and Andrew got to see that, Right. And then he got to see Jesus die and Jesus come back to life. He got to see things. And I think there's an invitation for us in that too. If we will do our best to be where Jesus is, for those of you who aren't Christians, if you will choose to follow Jesus, then you will see some things 
that you would never have been able to see apart from him. Some amazing, miraculous, life-changing things, if you will, follow Jesus. The story continues. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who would follow Jesus. Listen, the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John, you will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The first thing Andrew does after he meets Jesus is that he goes and tells someone else about him. Just tell somebody. I would also point out here that he moves from rabbi, it's a nice word, respectful, to Messiah, right? Like the closer he gets to Jesus, you'll see this in the story, the closer people begin to get to Jesus, the the more elevated the titles become for who he is. And so he goes from rabbi for Andrew to the Messiah, which was the anointed prophet, priest, and king that the Israelites looked forward to. It was like the coming one who would set things right for Israel. So he goes from a, a great teacher to the anointed one who's going to set things right for the Israelite people in just a quick minute, right? He spent one day with him. One day, and he has elevated him past just a great teacher into the Messiah. But immediately, immediately, he goes to his brother and he says, look, I need to tell you about this person that I have met. I need to tell you about this person who I have met. Now, we're gonna come back to that idea, but first, I just wanna, I just wanna say that, that Peter's name gets changed here, and it's this It's kind of a weird first impression moment, right? Like, I mean, hey, I'm gonna, like if I met you and I'm like, hey, Justin, I'm gonna call you Bob. Like, I mean, like, wait, what? Like, that's that's a strange, like, hi, nice to meet you too, you know? But this isn't, what's interesting is that that becomes a big deal historically for the church and for Peter himself. But here, that doesn't seem to be the intent of, of what John's writing. Instead, the intent seems to be that Jesus knows. It's the knowledge of Jesus about this man named Peter. And that idea will come up again later. But what I'd say to you is that Jesus knows you and he still wants you to follow him. I think some of us, it's like, we're just so scared that if like anybody knew us, then they wouldn't want to be around us. And sometimes that gets translated to to Jesus, right? Like, If Jesus really knows me, then Jesus doesn't want me to be his follower. And and right here, as as he meets Peter, he demonstrates, and he demonstrates this again in a minute, like, I know you. I know you deeply and intimately, and I want to have a relationship with you. Next two verses say, the next day Jesus decided to leave from Galilee, finding Philip. He said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Now, it's interesting here, this note that they're from the same town, and that's led a lot of people to believe, and I think this sounds right, that, that it is because, it's because of their witness that they actually go to Philip. Andrew and Peter are from this town, and so Jesus goes there, and he meets this guy named Philip, and it seems to be that Peter and Andrew say, hey, Jesus, we know this other guy that might be interested in getting to know you. And if that is true, then every single person in this passage who has a first impression of Jesus has it because somebody else has invited them to have it. I want you to notice the language here. They say, look, they tell, they bring. And then the final section will say, come and see. The reality is that everybody, after having their first encounter with Jesus, immediately feels the need to share Jesus with somebody else. That's true for almost every Christian that I know. When we first become Christians, it is so easy to go and share him with somebody else. But sometimes over time, we lose that. And I would just say to you today that maybe we need to get that back. One of the great convictions in my heart, and I've said this in sermons, it's been going on years, and so it's been said before, but I am just so frustrated with myself that I don't talk about Jesus more naturally. Like, and I'm a guy, you, you who know me know this, like if I'm passionate about something, I talk about it. But it's so countercultural to talk about Jesus and, and frankly, I think that I forget what it was like to first encounter him and as the years have gone on, I just have found it less and less natural to bring him up. I talk about sports, I talk about good coffee shops, I talk about Mexican food, but I don't find myself talking about Jesus. 
And I think that that happens because we forget how great it was when we first met him. And if something in these stories you know, should ring a bell for you, it's that, that to get back to that point when you remember how great it was to first discover what Jesus is like, what Jesus had done for you, and then start to share him with others. And I love that the sharing looks different in these different kind of interactions. It says, look. I think there's moments when we just ask somebody to explore whether they too should follow Jesus. I'll come back to that later. They tell. Sometimes it's just appropriate, man, I think it's a big deal to just share our story of how Jesus has changed our lives. I, 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 at this college retreat, I went to a breakout session. I don't even know if I was allowed to do that because I was like the speaker and not a college student, but I went and, and it was because I, I struggle with this. It's frustrating to me. And it was on sharing your testimony, your story of Christianity. And this girl leading it, she said this thing that I thought was really good. She said, our testimony doesn't have to be one story of when we were converted. It can just be a story about the ways in which God is working in your life or has worked at your life at the different points. And I was like, wow, like I should be talking about that, right? Like what's something God has done for me? You know, not just that moment when I became a Christian, but like in my life, the way God has provided for me or helped me or fixed a relationship as we prayed about earlier, like those moments should be on the tip of our tongue. So there's a time to say, hey, look, to invite people to explore. There's another time to just share our story. And then it says that they brought him. There's a time when we just invite people to come alongside of us, right? To explore Jesus alongside of us. I think that we need to look, tell, and bring, and it's not all in the same moment, but that's the natural response to knowing Jesus, to encountering Jesus, to being impressed upon by Jesus is to look, tell, and bring somebody else alongside of us. That can be scary because people can have a negative response, right? And that's exactly what happens in the next section of our passage this morning. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law. And about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still sitting under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, You believe me because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see even greater things than that. And he then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. I think that it's just a starting point to this is that they say, we found the one that was written about in Moses. And, and I think that's important because as we think about Jesus and, and as you think about sharing Jesus with somebody else, you, you don't always need to provide evidence but I think it's important that we know that there is evidence for Jesus being the Messiah, uh, the, the King of Israel, the Son of God, as Nathaniel says in this passage. I think that's really important. Uh, the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, talked about Jesus so specifically so that when these men who were Jewish people who believed the Old Testament came along and, and they, they met Jesus, then they said, we, this is the guy that was written about. Like, this is the one we've been looking forward to. And, and so for them, th- that evidence, even though the, it hadn't even played out, like they were able to look at something and draw upon something and say, look, this is the one that you were looking forward to. I think it's really important that they, that they, they contextualize the sharing of Jesus to others, right? They know that Nathaniel is a good Jew, a good Israelite that's looking forward to the one that they found. And so they, they say, hey, look, look, it's the one that you're looking forward to. But Nathaniel has the response that all of us fear, right? I mean, they, this is the response that, that we fear. He doesn't go, oh, I'm becoming a Christian now. Like, this is great. Let me follow Jesus too. He's like, come on, man. Like, there's no way that the Messiah has come from Nazareth. Like, Nazareth is a dumpster, you know? Like, I mean, this isn't, this is not where the king of Israel is coming from. This is not how this works. He argues. He argues with Philip. Now, I think there's two things that we would feel need to do in this situation, right? One, 
we would be like, this sucks. I finally tried to share Jesus with somebody and it didn't work. I'm out of here. You know, like that's, that's option one for most of us, right? Like, well, gave it a shot, Jesus. Glad that, you know, you can give me a crown in heaven or whatever because I gave an effort. That's one response. Number two response is to argue, right? Like, I mean, for, for me, it, you know, in my younger days, I think that the, the natural response for me in this moment would have been like, hey, I'll prove you wrong, right? Like, I will, I will show you why he is from Nazareth. Let's go look at the Old Testament. And there's, there's a moment for that, right? And I actually think there's a moment to say this maybe isn't the right moment for this person to receive Jesus. And there's a moment where we say, hey, let me prove it to you. But I think the middle thing that we see here from Philip to Nathaniel is so good. He just says, Come and see. Come and see. It's non threatening. It's an invitation. It is not shoving religion down another person's throat. This is, you know, the, the biggest sin in our society, it seems today. It is none of the, he just says, Come with me and explore this Jesus thing. I mean, what a great, what a great response right and what if we could get back to a place where we remembered what it was like when we had our first impressions of Jesus and they were so good and we could start to share Jesus again and when somebody said that can't be right I mean look at all the bad things Christians have done I mean that can't be right I mean Christians vote Republican I mean that can't be right like like I have a I had a neighbor once that was a Christian he was the biggest jerk that I ever lived by what if we didn't just, you know, well up with discouragement or anger, but instead we said, come and see. Like, I'll, I'll, walk, I'll walk with you to him. Now, I mean, what does that look like in our world today, right? Like, I mean, what is it? We can't be like, hey, here's Jesus, you know, like, Jesus, talk to him, tell him it's real. You know, like we can't, we can't do that so easily. But what if we responded like this? What if we responded like this? Hey, don't take my word for it, but how about you just try reading this part of the Bible? Just read it. Tell me what you think when you're done with it. Like, you know, at my church, we're studying the book of John. I would try reading like just the first chapter of John and see where it goes. Or how about this? Like, don't take my word for it. How about you just, just pray? You know, on the outside chance that there is a God and that this Jesus guy actually is the Savior of the world. And how about you just pray and just ask that God to maybe reveal himself to you? Come and see. Or how about I'll pray with you, you know, like depending on your relationship to this person. Like if you want, we could just pray and like, I mean, we just say, hey God, like if, if you're really up there and if Jesus is your son who saved the world, like, like, just reveal yourself to this person some way. How about like, hey, don't take my word for it, but I did read this great book that offers some evidence for why Jesus might actually be the Savior, and I'm willing to buy it for you. Like, maybe just like, hey, just check it out. Like, no big deal. We can talk about it if you want to later. Or how about like, hey, don't take my word for it, but come experience church with me. Because this is the reality, right? Like the church is to be the demonstration of Jesus on earth now that Jesus has gone back up into heaven. And, and while we can struggle along and not be perfect, the reality is that we demonstrate Jesus together far better than we can demonstrate Jesus alone to a person. And I'm happy to say that I think that's true of our church. Like if you go to our church, I think you can bring somebody here and they will get a better glimpse of Jesus and what Jesus is like than if they had not come here and been with us. I mean, we just get discouraged, give up, never tell anybody about Jesus for 100 years afterwards, like, well, I gave that a shot. Or we get defensive and angry and like, oh, those idiots, like, why can't you think like me? But how much better is come and see, come and see if it might be true. I'm gonna come back to that, but I just wanna say one thing. Jesus, at the end of this, refers to himself as the son of man. 
And, and I love that. I love that he calls himself the son of man. And it's actually the, the phrase that he like the title, like we've already been given a bunch of titles for Jesus, right? Like he's the word and then he's the Messiah and then he's the son of God and he's the king of Israel. Like all of these titles have come to us just at the first chapter of the book of John. But Jesus uses son of man. And, and I think this is the reason. Son of man was not tainted by all of the ideas of the religious leaders of the time. And so Jesus could take this title, use it for himself. It did connect to the Old Testament. So it pointed to the Old Testament being about him, but it also was free of all that, you know, that stuff that sometimes happens, right? Like the word Christian, they're similar today, right? There's all this stuff that comes to mind. But Jesus, he, he cut through all that with son of man. And, and when he uses son of man, it's almost as if he says, I invite you to find out about who I am for yourself. It's really perfect for a sermon series on first impressions because Jesus is like, hey, I don't, I don't want you to have all of the, you know, the, the baggage with titles. I just want you, and this is an invitation for all of us, I want you to come along and see what I am really like and more importantly, who I really am. And as we move our way through the book of John, like that's, you know, this already, if you've been around, like John is writing this to say, this is the Messiah, the son of God. He wants you to know those two things about Jesus. And as he presents Jesus calling himself the son of man, it's like the invitation remains, hey, just come and see, come and see. D.A. Carson of Andrew at the very beginning, he said about him, he thus became the first in a long line of successors who have discovered that the most common and effective Christian testimony is the private witness of a friend to a friend, brother to a brother. For those of you who aren't Christians, you sit here today, I would just say to you, we just come and see I mean, will you, will you, you know, keep showing up to church? Will you keep hanging out with your Christian friend? Will you, will you maybe think about buying a book or asking me for a book, you know, that might help you understand, you know, the claims of Jesus and why we believe the things that we believe? Will you read through the book of John and, and you know, have an open mind? Will you ask God to, to maybe reveal himself to you and whether this whole deal is true? Will you just come and see? And for those of us who are Christians, I just would say to you this morning, like in a very real way, like think about who you can, you can share Jesus with. That's probably a very normal cliche point in Christian circles. But then I would say, and as you think about who you can and should share Jesus with, would you think about how you can share Jesus with him? Is it that person a person that you just need to invite to look like, hey, just look into this. Will you just look into this? Or is that a person that you need to tell your story to? Maybe God would call you to share your story with somebody. Or is that a person that you need to bring along with you? You need to invite them to see with you. Maybe read the Bible with them or invite them to come to church with you. I think we have this, like, I just need to share my story, get in, get out. But maybe you would say this morning, God would lay somebody on your, this afternoon, God would lay somebody on your heart and then out of that, he would also lay on your heart how you might share Jesus with them as you think about the moments when you first encountered Jesus and how it changed your life. When you first met Jesus, you were excited to share him with others. And I hope today God would bring you back to that a little bit. So come and see, or if you've already seen and you already know, then go and share. Go and share with somebody else. Let me pray that we'll be a church that does that. Lord Jesus, I want to ask for anybody sitting in front of me, anybody watching online, that you, God, would cut through the, God, all of the maybe things that, that, that they've thought about you that are incorrect. Lord, I think that, that, that God, the true character of who you are, Jesus, has been tainted by by, by false teaching sometimes, by the world just dumping stuff upon you that actually isn't true, by um, bad experiences in church or with Christians, and, and people can view you through those lenses that are just not true, and I pray that today, God, uh, you know, as I finish, Lord, that you, would, that you would compel people to actually look into who you are, 
Jesus, because man, I know from personal experience that you that you are so incredible, far more incredible than, than, than we act like often, God, even as Christians. And so I pray, Lord, that, that be, just through my words, my measly effort, God, at teaching your word this morning, that you, would, that you God, would, would just speak into people's lives and you would compel them to come and see that they would explore you, God. And then for those of us that are Christians, take us back, God, to that moment when we first met you and we were so impressed by you, and, and we felt so powerfully, God, what you could do for us. And all we wanted to do was be near to you. And I pray you'd return us to that place at least a little bit, God. And then out of that, Lord, just let us be a people that share you, God. Lord, you know that our church is not a church that, you know, it's not like our goal just to become a big church or anything like that. But it is our goal, God. It is one of our biggest goals to baptize people every single week in this church. And I, I've believed forever and I continue to believe that it'll only happen, God, as, as we become a church that has, has people who share you with others, Lord. And so put on our minds the people that we should share you with, Lord. And then show us how we should share you, God. Whether it's just inviting people to look, whether it's sharing our testimony, telling people about you, God, and what you've done for us, or whether it's inviting them to come alongside of us, God, at church or you know, in, in group or, you know, through reading the Bible together, whatever it might be, just, just put it on our hearts and then help us to do it, Lord. I pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.